In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we remember, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. We remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, noted many of the challenges in the church, but the one that topped the list, if you will, was it was brought to Paul's attention that there was a son having physical relationship with his dad's wife. We remember that in 1 Corinthians 5. And so that was really kind of the pinnacle, amongst all the other nonsense. But that was the pinnacle. And so Paul reported back in the first letter to the Corinthians, he says, hey, deliver such a one to Satan. In other words, take this man that's having relationships with his dad's wife, take him and cast him out of the church. Because we remember what was currently going on in the Corinthian church, they were boasting about their liberty. Oh, we're showing grace to the sinner. And Paul was saying, oh no, we show grace, but we also point out sin. And we don't allow it. We don't allow it. You don't get, you know, anybody can come into this church and have their lifestyle, but you don't get a platform to promote that lifestyle. Oh, anybody's welcome. Anybody is welcome to come and sit. But you don't get to promote ungodly activity. You don't get to do that. You do that somewhere else. Frankly, you go to City Hall or whatever and announce that. But you don't do it in, in, in the Christian church. And that's what Paul is saying. You have allowed this lifestyle practically to be promoted. And so Paul was correcting that amongst the other things. But again, this is the pinnacle. So deliver this man, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. In other words, Paul is saying, cast him out of the church that maybe that might arrest his attention. Being booted out of the church. That might get his attention. So turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, we remember in 1 Corinthians 5, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So let his flesh be tormented that his spirit would finally be reawakened. And that's what Paul was saying. And so Paul realized that the Corinthian church had done exactly that. They casted this man out. And we'll, we'll qualify that later in, in 2 Corinthians. But Paul had, had gotten word back that, oh yeah, hey Paul, they, the Corinthian church casted this man out. And so Paul was saying, so you did that and now you're grievous. You've understood the error of your sin. You're promoting this man in the church. Now you're having a hard time. So that's why I didn't, I, that's why I delayed my return. I was wanting you to kind of heal from that and be ministered to by the Lord. I didn't want to disrupt that. But was that the message that the outside influences were bringing? Certainly not. See, that's where outside influences come. They come when you're vulnerable. When you're down, does Satan come and say, oh, gee, I hope you get better so we can get back into the spar? Is that what he says to you? No, no not at all. So these demonic influence, outside influences were kicking the church while it was down. Kicking Paul while he was out of, this, out of the picture, so to speak. And Paul has finally gotten to a point and said, hey, I've got to deal with this. I've let it go. I've been praying about it. I've left it with the Lord, but now the Lord is saying, Paul, I need you to now put pen back to paper. I need you to write this second Corinthians letter. So guys, I've delayed my, my revisitation because you were sorrowful. You saw the error of your ways, and I wanted the Lord to minister to you. And so in verse 3, Paul continues in, in, our, in our text, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, 
having confidence in you that all that my joy is in the joy of you all. And so I resisted from returning so quickly because I knew you were down in the dumps. And frankly, Corinthian Church, when I come back to see you again, man, I want it to be a good time. I want it to be upbeat. I want it to be joyful. For out of much affliction, verse 4, and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Did you catch that? I wrote during much affliction. And as I was writing the letter, I had, an, I had anguish of heart and many tears. Paul is saying you're listening to nonsense and you know it's not true about me. You know in the bottom of your heart it's not true. You know that. You know that I've loved you. You know that I've cared for you. You know that I've poured into you. So don't be pulled away by this nonsense that's coming in from every different direction. Stand fast in the Lord, as Paul concluded his first letter. Be steadfast, immovable. <coughs> but with much affliction, with anguish of heart, and many tears, I wrote to you that you may know the love which I have for you. Now, correction is rarely easy for someone to receive. Amen? Right? I mean, it's tough. May I boldly suggest that the hardest task for a leader in ministry is correction. It's correction. I hate having to correct people. I can't stand it. I beg the Lord, Lord, wouldn't, wouldn't you please step in? And of course, the Lord's always in the incident. But Lord, I really don't want to be your messenger in this thing. I want to be the messenger of glad tidings and good cheer, right? I don't want to come and say, hey, man, i got to take you out of your position. What? I mean, the minute I say that to anybody, trust me, they turn around and say, oh, you're from Satan himself. I mean, I've heard it all. It's amazing. Absolutely incredible. The hardest task for a leader, I suggest, is the corrective measure. People don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it. You know what? That old saying, a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. Well, we know a couple of Bible verses, and all of a sudden, we're qualified <coughs> to know what the Lord is speaking to the pastor. I mean, Moses was challenged, remember? And remember when the earth opened up? And Korah went, Wow. <laughs> Scary stuff. And here Moses is the most humble guy that, that had walked the earth. And yet after he was being challenged, the Lord said, no, you know. And now Paul is being challenged. And Paul is saying, no, this is going to stop. This is the Lord's church. It has to stop. So my love, I, you know through tears, through anguish of heart, through much affliction, you know my love for you. Because even after all the nonsense, I am still with you. Not physically. I'm with you spiritually, yes. My desire is to be with you physically. But we remember Paul was the missionary church planter. Paul was constantly on the move. And Paul was guided by God the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't apologize for that. He's just reminding the Corinthian church, my desire was to come to you, but the Lord changed my plan. Far be it from me to argue with the Lord. And so that's why I'm penning this, this letter to you to show you, hey, the reason why I'm not there currently is because the Lord has me on a different mission. But I'll return. It'll be okay. But I still want to bring these corrections to you through letter. And in verse 5, he continues, But if anyone has caused grief, oh, he has not grieved me. So the, this man that was having relationships with his dad's wife, you know what? He, he didn't, it doesn't really bother me. I mean, it's wrong, I'll point it out. It bothers me in that regard. But I'm not offended by that. 
I mean, so, hey, if anyone has caused grief, well, just understand he has not grieved me. But all of you, to some extent, not to be too severe. So Paul is saying, yes, the church has been grieved. Correctly so. So you acted. And you punished. And in verse 6, this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, by the, the church board, what have you, this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man engaged in this particular behavior. So the decision to remove the man from the fellowship was correct. It was sufficient. So that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him. So you've removed him. He's no longer a liability to the church. He's out in the streets now. But now you should consider forgiveness and comfort, lest perhaps such a one, unless this man, become swallowed up with too much sorrow. Remember when we introduced this letter? Paul is going to, re Paul revealed to us as we kind of summarize a little bit, you and I have the ministry of reconciliation restoring friendly relationships. So Paul is saying, you identified the sin, you responded to it, and you removed that person from the fellowship. Correctly so. Now, as a period of time has gone on, you now need to respond back to this man in order that he don't, that he does not become <coughs> swallowed up because of his guilt. This man has recognized his sin, and now that he has publicly addressed that and proclaimed that, you now need to go alongside him. You need to comfort him. You need to run to him. And verse 8, reaffirm your love to this man. The corrective measures have worked. Now, go restore. Reach out. Because otherwise, Satan will come along and swallow him up. Satan will come along and say, nobody wants you. Your dad doesn't want you. The church doesn't want you. You're out here in the street. Nobody wants you. And Paul is saying, uh-uh, don't let it happen. He has repented, run to his side. Run to him and reaffirm your love toward, to him. Verse 9, for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test. Are you going to listen to my direction and not only listen but follow up? It's a test, Paul was saying. These things I've written to you have not been suggestions. They're not things that you should debate with your factions. No, these are <coughs> commands. They're commands of the Lord. And I have the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver this. So now the question is, are you going to follow these directions? Paul was saying. This is a test. I want to see whether you are obedient in all things. To test of the Lord. Now, whom you forgive anything, hey, I also forgive. I'm not offended. You want to forgive them? Great. I'm, I'm down. They're clear in your eyes? I'm with you. I trust you. You're spirit -filled, a spirit-filled congregation. You say, hey, we want to restore the guy Paul says, great. I'm right behind you. I'm not going to argue that with you. That's a local issue. And we need to deal locally with issues. And that's what Paul is saying. Take care of it. If you're telling me that you're going to restore the guy, hey, praise the Lord. That's great. You're in authority in, in the church and the fellowship that God has placed you. Good. I'm, I'm good for that. Thanks for letting me know. So you forgive him? Hey, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Here's the hook, verse 11. Lest Satan should take advantage of us. We're all in this together. 
You're telling me that he is qualified, he has refreshed himself, he has repented, he has changed. You understand that? And you know what? I'm with you. I support you 100%. You're my proof. You've told me the man has changed. That's all I need. I don't need a videotape. I don't need any audio. I'm not going to send Timothy to hide out and watch his activity. You're telling me the guy's golden? I'm good. Under the glory of the Lord, lest Satan should take advantage of us. Lest Satan should say, oh, you know, this guy's a loser. Leave him outside. And Paul say, oh, no, we're not going to let Satan take advantage of us and leave one of God's anointed outside. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that because we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We're not ignorant. We are smart, spirit-filled Bible-educated men and women. Now we need to qualify our position. That's why we have fellowship. That's why in the women's ministry, in the men's ministry throughout the week, we have the formal study. It's formal. And we all sit and listen. We have pen and paper and we're taking notes and we're following along. And when we have a question, then we might just write down a little bullet note. Oh, ask afterward that I need a little clarification. Okay, I'll just jot that down. Because we don't disrupt anything. The, the, the teaching is going along smoothly. So okay, I'll, I'll just jot that down so I don't forget. And half the time, lo and behold, my question gets answered further into the study, right? How many times has that happened? You go, oh, okay, great. Scratch that up. But see, we didn't disrupt anything. We didn't disrupt God and the Holy Spirit. So in our men and women's studies, we have our formal teaching, and then we open it up for conversation, if necessary. Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have a, something they need to clarify? As we're going to be gathering in communion this morning, if anyone has a question about their salvation, this is the place to ask. We don't have to go outside these doors and say, gee, am I qualified to take communion or not? We ask right here. Because the answers are held right here in the body of Christ. So we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Satan wants to divide. God has come and conquered and united. And that's what this letter is all about. That ministry of reconciliation. Reaffirming friendly relationships. And that's what's happening here. So first off, I asked you guys to make some corrections in the church. You have done that. We're going to qualify that here in a couple of minutes. You have done that. Furthermore, in verse 12, I believe this is the second reason Paul is going to say why I delayed my return. So the first reason is, is that you were in much sorrow as the Lord was ministering to you. So while you were in your sorrow and allowing the, I, I want to allow the Lord to minister to you, I stayed out of your way. The second reason I delayed my return was that when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me. Remember in chapter, in 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, Paul said, I was delayed in Ephesus because God opened a door for me. And so Paul is saying, I have my plans, like much like you and I, but when the Lord's leading our lives, and he says, oh, those are great plans, Greg, but this is what you're going to do today. That's what Paul was saying. Oh, I have my plans to come and visit you, but the Lord said, oh, no. I want you to go to Ephesus, and after that, I want you to go to Troas. And so this is the second reason Paul is explaining. You, you're wondering why I delayed my visit? And the outside influences are trying to say, oh, because Paul's weak, and he's afraid? Contrary. Couldn't be further from the truth. So I delayed my return because the Lord opened the door for me, and yet, in verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit. So the Lord opened this door in Troas, and I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. So 
we have to wonder, well, what was the problem? I mean, sure, Titus is, is, is Paul's brother and a companion and friend, but why does he have no rest in his spirit? Well, when we fast forward to chapter 7, Paul reveals to us that he finally ran into Titus, and Titus gave the report of the Corinthian church. And that's what Paul was hoping to meet Titus here in, in verse 13, but he didn't. He's like, man, I was hoping to get the report, but it's not there. So I, I had no rest in my spirit. I was kind of anxious. I was you know, still praying, Lord, what's happening at Corinth? Show me, Lord. Show me. The Lord said, I will in my good timing. But right now, I want you to deal with the folks here and preach the gospel in trials. That's what I want you to do right now, Paul. And Paul was obedient to that. Okay, fair enough. I will do that. And again, in chapter 7, we'll see that Titus brought that good report. That's why Paul knows he's writing this, because he already got this information. In chapter 7, he got it and said, hey, the Corinthian church has responded. And in chapter 7, we'll detail that. But Paul hasn't revealed that quite yet. And so we cheated and we went forward, right? <laughs> You went to the plot. You know how you go to the back of the book sometimes? <laughs> all right. Cool. And that's what we do. We cheat all the time. <laughs> and so again, in, in chapter 7, Paul will give us that detail. And so I had no rest in my, my spirit. I realized I was but taking my leave of them. So I gave them the gospel. The Lord said, now it's time to move on. And then I departed from Macedonia. That's another reason why I didn't come and visit you right away. These are not the reports that the outside influences are giving to you. So beware, Paul is saying. Be very careful. Be very, very careful. Good counsel for Paul here. Very good counsel. Now as Paul closes his thoughts in verse 14, thanks be to God. Isn't that nice? Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Thanks be be to God for the victory that we live in in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Man, are you kidding me? Thanks for that reminder. We need that reminder, army of God, don't we? We need that. So thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us, through us, he, God, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Fragrance. Fragrance attracts. Ladies put on a little perfume. It's to attract. It's, it's pleasant. When my wife puts something on, it's pleasant. I like it. When my wife and I just the other day were walking down the, uh, the, the sidewalk, and we were walking by Petco, and then we started walking by the store Kirkland. You familiar with Kirkland? Anybody familiar with that store Kirkland? And there was a fragrance that was coming out of the store Kirkland. And you know what that fragrance did? It drew our attention. Now, as we were walking by Petco, there was a fragrance coming out of that <laughs> And we kind of speeded up our pace. And I kind of scooted along. But when we got to, to Kirkland, we thought, and my wife said, that's a great smell. Isn't that nice? And did they do that on purpose? And we started having this conversation. I had to suggest, I said, yeah, I, they must be doing this on purpose. I mean, it draws our attention. It's attractive. It gets our attention. It got, it, you know, it even got non-believers' attention also, right? I mean, we're born again. It got our attention. And even the pagans got their attention too. So we're united in this fragrance, you see? The fragrance worked. And so Paul goes on to say, hey, God is using you and I as diffusers. In other words, the units to dispense fragrance. What is that fragrance? Verse 15, we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are both being saved and also among those who are perishing as demonstrated by the fragrance out of Kirkland. It attracted both believer and non-believer. It attracted, it got our attention. Are we together? So the fragrance of Christ that is being diffused out of your life is attractive both to the believer and the non-believer. 
both. People know who you are as a Christian because your life diffuses the fragrance of Christ. That's what's happening. And that's attractive to both the believer and sometimes it's a repellent to the non-believer because when you walk into the room, people are reminded, oh, there's an aroma here and it's a, an aroma that I don't want to be reminded of. What's that aroma? Aroma? Verse 16, to the one we are the aroma of death. When you and I walk into a room, we remind non-believers often that they are hopeless without Christ. That's the reminder. That you and I are God's diffusers. Okay? And we walk into that lunchroom and all of a sudden... The off jokes stop. The activity, the off activity stops. And how many times has, has someone been speaking to you and they use some perhaps colorful language? And then all of a sudden they go, oh gee, I'm sorry. Yeah. And our response is it's like, hey, it's not like I've never heard that vocabulary before. But the thing is, is you don't have to be sorry to me. I mean, I appreciate that. But really, the one you need to be sorry to is the Lord himself. Would you like to get right with the Lord right now? <laughs> when I used to go to auditions for cover bands and things, and I was looking for some gigs and some side things to do years ago. And I never told anyone that I, first of all, that I never told anyone I was a, a Christian, let alone tell them I was a pastor. So I'd go into the audition and I'd lay down my chops and usually it went pretty well. And they'd say, man, yeah, man, we'd love to, love to work with you. We'd love to have you on board. And I said, yeah, oh, great. So we start talking and fellowshipping a little bit and said, oh, by the way, what do you do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, Pastor Calvary Chapel. <laughs> I mean, it's, hey, don't have a heart attack. Really, it's okay, fellas. It's all right. You need some air? Let me get you some water. All right? You good? Yeah, 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 we're good. See, I, I was diffusing a fragrance, and then I revealed it. And all of a sudden, I was the fragrance, the aroma of death leading to death. These guys knew. I'm not right with the Lord. I'm not right. And I need to get right. And that was the whole point. That's why the Lord had me at that particular scenario. That's why the Lord has you in particular scenarios. Don't question them. Don't question Don't worry about it. But just know you're diffusing the fragrance of Christ. The Lord will use that fragrance accordingly. You're just the diffuser. Now, to the other folks, we are the aroma of life leading to life. What happens when you and I get together in fellowship? Man, we're enjoying ourselves. We might be revealing some challenges. We, maybe we're unloading some things. Good stuff. I mean, it's good to unload some things. But you know what? It happens when we are in physical fellowship. It doesn't happen when we're watching TV. It can't. But it happens in fellowship. It's for our benefit. This, this gathering is not for the Lord's benefit at all. It's for us. We benefit. We leave here. And man, we're ready to go. We're refreshed as the army of God. And that's the point of fellowship. We come together as a body of Christ. Oh, we laugh, we cry, we hug, and sometimes we point a finger, but we get it ironed out, right? We can't do that over the phone or whatever. We've got to do it face to face. Hey, man, we got to sit out. we got to iron this out. What's going on? I don't know. Let's figure it out. So this is what the fellowship So We're an aroma of life leading to life as we gather as a body of Christ. It's a good thing. And who is sufficient for these things? In verse 17, for we are not as so many 
handling the Word of God. But we are teaching with sincerity from the Lord, and we speak in the sight of God, glorifying Christ. That's what we're doing. That's what our fragrance is doing. It's drawing people's attention. You're either right with Christ, or you're not. Oh, man. What do I do about that? In a way, the Lord is, is glorifying Himself through the fragrances that we diffuse. Amen? And it's the fragrance of Christ. So I ask the worship team to come join me. And as we prepare for communion this morning, we want to be reassured and reminded that we are the Lord. If you are born again, if you have Christ as your Savior, you are free, welcomed, and invited to commune with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If He's not your Lord and Savior, then we recommend, and actually the Scripture commands, it's not a suggestion, but the Scripture tells us that we do not partake for the sufferings of Christ if Jesus is not our Lord. We have to be very careful. And so as the young people come this morning, they're going to help serve, assist, we're grateful. But as we take our elements, Sam and the team, they're going to lead us in a song. And we're going to take this time and meditate. And we're going to sit with the Lord and be reminded of His goodness. Young people come. And you that are born again, I invite you to partake in the elements. If you have any questions about your salvation, the kids are going to do it. We have our eldership here. Just come straight up, and we will speak to you about your salvation and about the communion bread and cup. So if you're unsure, come up immediately, and we will receive you. In the meantime, let's worship. Praise the Lord. And really, if you have a question, please come forward. Let's commune with the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Ministry of Reconciliation, reestablishing friendly relationships. That's the activity and the function of the church. Amen. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we want to show the world and invite the world. Join us by standing. If you have a prayer afterward, after the song, please join us up front. The eldership will be here. The prayer partners will be here. They want to speak to you and encourage you, and so we invite you up right after the song. In the meantime, let's be reminded that we have a river of life flowing through our lives. Amen? Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos, and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we want to challenge you, why not share these videos. You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much, and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.